Welcome back. This is a second part of hacking the OWASP Ushop. As you learned you know, before, Ushop is a learning environment that you can practice many different skills related to ethical hacking and penetration testing and specifically for finding vulnerabilities in web applications. So if you have not checked the previous video that I introduced the Ushop, please do so and we have a link in the description. So let's get started. One thing that changed from last week is that there is a new version of Jushop available. And what I did is I actually upgraded the Websploit and specifically the container for Jushop with that new version. And what you can do to set up your environment uh, or to at least upgrade is to follow the command that I'm highlighting in the screen. Basically just doing a curl dash SSL and the first S lowercase and then uppercase S um, uppercase L and then you know specifying the websploit.org URL and then slash upgrade juice shop and then dot sh which is a, a shell script a very short shell script that I created that will delete the current container and it will you know uh, also delete the image and then pull back the image from Docker Hub and then instantiate it with the correct port and the correct configuration. So once you do the curl, you pipe that to sudo bash. So uh, basically you get some prompts that you're about to upgrade the Ushop container. And then you know from there, it, it stops and removes the containers, as I mentioned to you uh, before, and then adds the new container. And it's completely automated. You know, everything will be will be back uh, to normal. Now, if you navigate to it, in this case, I'm going to port 8882, which is the port that we, you know, we have configured that container to run on. Um, you know, you actually see the new version of Ushop and the look and feel is a little bit different than before. However, it has very similar exercises and more, which is actually a, a perfect thing here. So last time we went over a lot of exercises in Ushop in the one star category. Today we are actually going to explore several other exercises in many other uh, categories, right? So in other words, the higher the number of stars, the more difficult the exercise will be. So we have the scoreboard in front of us. So let's actually take a look at the first one here in the two category. So the two star category. And that is called the admin section. And it's asking you to access the administration section of the store. And apparently it's a broken access control uh, problem the, or vulnerability that we actually have to look, right? Now, as you, you know, explore before, you know that you can quickly take a look at the source code of the page to try to find other locations that may be in in comments or in you know other hyperlinks uh, and so on just like we did for the scoreboard so if you remember we actually right click on the on the browser and then with the inspector we were actually able to find the scoreboard by just you know uh, doing control f for a quick find and then typing scoreboard in this case we can actually do something similar and then just type admin and see if anything matches well, in this case, we were not that successful or we were not that lucky, right? So we actually have to deep dive a little bit more and uh, definitely, you know, it's not as, as easy as it was last week. All right, so one of the things you can do is go over the network tab and in there you can also explore many different files that are being called in by the, you know, web application or the web page. And in this case, you see files including pictures and, and um, you know, JavaScript code and everything else. And, and as a matter of fact, JavaScript may be an interesting place to look for additional, you know, references. So you can filter out, you know, the different type of files by, and in this case, JavaScript files by doing a control F, right, for, for a quick find, and then typing .js. 
And as you see here, we actually have several JavaScript files. And one of the, the ones that attract my interest is main-es2015.js, right? And we can actually open it by just double click on it and then do a quick find for the word admin. And as you can see here, there's actually a path that, um, or at least a reference to a path and what it looks to be a JSON file within the system. And in that path, there's the word administration. So what if we actually put this in the URI? So I'm copying and pasting and putting the URI. Well, it looks like actually that didn't work, right? So you have administration and adds a pound sign. And earlier, you also saw that the application adds a pound sign to many of the locations that we had, including the scoreboard. So what if actually we put a pound slash administration? And in there, now we're getting a little bit closer. Now we're getting a forbidding or a 403 message in the screen. So what if we actually go here and attempt to do a quick SQL injection? And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm doing a Boolean SQL injection to the login page, right? So if I actually go over and try to log in and, um, you know, perhaps, you know, being able to either show all the users that are within the, the environment or, you know, potentially get some type of error messages so I can get additional information from the database, we may be able to be successful to collect some information. So in this case, I'm actually escaping the email entry. So instead of putting me an email for logging in, I'm putting a single quote and then or, then one equals one, which is true, dash dash. And let's see what that does. And as you can see, wow, we were able to actually solve the challenge because in this case, we were able to log into the administrator user account. So what if we actually go back and instead of going to the, you know, instead of being here, going to the administrator session. And there you go. We all actually solved that as well. So we solved two different challenges here. You were able to find a SQL injection vulnerability in the login page, and you were able to also solve the admin section challenge, which is actually accessing this page, which is the administration section of the score or the store, the rather. Then in the same administration section, you see that there's some customer feedback in there. What if we actually are able to delete you know, some of this feedback? And there you go. You actually solve another challenge, which is to get rid of all five-star customer feedbacks in the environment. In other words, you know, this was you know, fairly easy one after the other. But if you think about the methodology, you're trying to look for references to potential hidden directories or hidden files within the system by looking at other files and by, as a matter of fact, look just using your browser. I did not use any other tool other than my browser here. The other thing that I want to highlight is that whenever we were going over, you know, uh, looking at the administration, you know, we were, it's trial and error, right? It, this is not going to be like in the movies that you type a whole bunch of keystrokes in the keyboard and you're going to be able to actually hack, right? In this case, it takes a lot of trial and error and in many cases, actually, as you go through uh, and learn more about, you know, exploitation, in many cases, an exploit can take you a couple of hours, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, right? It all depends on the scenario. And uh, in this case, you know, of course, this is a fairly uh, introductory uh, exercise on where you look for the administration, you get some error messages from the, you know, and in this case was a 403 message which is a forbidden message, right? And one of the things that I always highlight is that you become familiar with the HTTP error messages. If you want to become a pen tester, a concentration, you know, concentrated in web application penetration testing. So in this case, we get a 403 and we try to actually look for other things that we can leverage. Things like SQL injection and my, you know, the Boolean expression for that SQL injection and, um, you know, we were, we were able to actually at least log in as an attack account in here and a privilege account, in this case, administrator. And then once we had that logged in or we were logged in as the administrator, then we were going back to the administration site 
and then look for more things to potentially exploit and potentially gather. So again, another quick example of how to go through the methodologies, which by the way, hacking is all about the methodologies, it's not about only tools, and then you know, going over to what information you know, we can gather and what other things we can actually exploit within the environment. Let's go over another quick example here. Uh, let's pick a uh, view basket. Uh, so view another user's shopping basket, uh, what they call basket or shopping cart. So um, we know that we can log in as the user that we created before. I'm going to log in as user one. And then once I'm in there, I can put you know an item to my shopping cart. Once I put the item in my shopping cart, I shall be able to see my basket or shopping cart basket, you know, um, we in the US at least we, we refer to it as a shopping cart most of the time. But now that we're in the basket, um, we can basically try to inspect the same uh, page, just like the, the, the we did before. And once you go there, you know, of course you can go around all the different elements. Uh, I don't think that we can do much with the debugger or console but let's go to storage, right? Which in many cases, that's where you see the session storage for the specific user, right? Or some information related to the specific user. And there you can actually see things like bid and the item total and so on. And you see that bid has a specific value and the value in this case is six. So what if we actually edit that value and instead of six, we can probably put a seven and then hit enter. And then from there, we can probably move, uh, you know, go to another page, come back to the basket and see what happens. And there you go. You actually were able to access somebody else's. So they had a numeric value here that is super predictable, right? So instead of a six, you know, I increased it by one and that's a seven. And I assume that there was another user um, that potentially had a, a, another, you know, a basket ID of seven, so a higher number. But in reality, you know, you could have actually gone backwards. So instead of a six, you can go to five because it's more likely that somebody else in this case, you know, had an earlier item put into their basket. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, this is what I want to highlight in this example is the basically manipulation of, you know, data in a predictive way. So in this case, you know, we're actually looking for sp for specific key value that in, in this example is called bid. And it's super, super easy, you know, to, to figure out that is, you know, it's definitely predictable because it's just a single number. But in many cases, whenever you're talking about session IDs and session tokens, if you use predictable session IDs, or if you use a weak pseudo random number generator, then you will run into problems like this one where an attacker can bypass authorization or can access somebody else's um, you know, uh, information or potentially you know, modify somebody else's information. It all depends on the vulnerability and the intrinsic you know, underlying flaw and the root cause of the vulnerability. But in this case, you actually see that we were able to solve that challenge fairly easily. So let's go over another exercise, but let's go over something more difficult. Let's go to the three star category and I'm going to hide the number two. And let's go on down the list. Um, oh, this one, it looks cool. You know, place an order that makes you rich, right? And then the cool thing about this is that also tells you about the underlying vulnerability or the underlying flaw, right? In this case is improper input validation. So um, a few things that actually I want to highlight as well as, as far as the new version of Jushop is that you also have these uh, little icons in the scoreboard. And basically what it does is starts an interactive tutorial for a specific challenge. So it actually walks you through the, through the exercise. I'm not going to do this in here. You can do this in your own, right? I'm going to do ones that you don't have any type of input or any type of clues to be able to solve that exercise. So again, place an order that makes you rich. 
So if that's the case, right, let's see if we're logged in. And so yes, we are. We're logged in as user one. And let me verify that we don't have anything in the basket and we don't have anything here. So one of the things that you can do is you can configure your uh, browser to send all the traffic or all the transactions between your browser and the web application to a proxy. And you learned that in the previous uh, video that I did here for you. Now, if you go all the way down in the browser settings and click on network settings, you can actually set up the proxy and set it up to 127.0.0.1 on port 8080, which is the default port that things like Burp Suite will be you know, uh, using right, to, to intercept the transaction. And I already have Burp Suite running in here. And we're going to turn intercept on. And then I'm going to go and add an item to my basket. And then from there, I'm going to inspect a few things. And uh, as you can see, if I, after I forwarded the packet here, I see a few things related to a product. And the challenge is to make an order that will make us rich, right? So if you look, we have a basket ID, a product ID, right? So if we change the product ID, probably that's not going to do much for your advantage. Uh, the basket ID, you know, we're, we don't want to access somebody else's basket. But the quantity... What if instead of one, uh, they're going to give us, you know, credit for some, right? So we can put negative 100. And if I forward that to the application and I keep on forwarding it, you know, of course, there's a lot of transactions, a lot of beacons coming out. Then I can go back to my basket. And in this case, actually, I don't even need to do intercept on. Now I see that the item is a negative number, right? So... Here we have the apple juice that I selected. And instead of one, we have negative 100. And the price is 199. However, you see the total price is negative 199. So basically, if I check out, and let's add a, an address in here, let's like put United States. And then, you know, of course, my, no, my um, name and some number here for the phone and apparently it has to be in that format there you go that should be okay it's of course fictitious and then we put some uh, zip code and then from here we provide some address and I'm going to be fairly brief in here just for simplicity uh, but let's put New York And then click submit and of course there's nothing here is correct but you know it's a fictitious application anyway so we can click on continue and it looks like you know it's asking us to a delivery speed let's check one day why not and there you go it says pay using wallet wallet balance of zero and then you have negative 191 dollars and one cent and then in order to check out, you have to add a credit card or debit card. And of course, you know, let's put a credit card number here. Perfect credit card number. And then I guess it has to be 16 digit. So there you go. Uh, some 2094 year as an expiration date. Click submit. Now we have a credit card on file. Let's pay for this. And you see that now I have negative 100 apple juice of 199 each, right? And then the total is 198.01. We got 99 cents for delivery. We probably could have actually modified that too. But just for simplicity, I'm going to click on place an order and see what happens. And there you go. We were able to solve the challenge of getting an order that will make us rich, right? So again, another example of input validation and also predictable fields that you can take advantage in an application. Let's go over another exercise. Let's look down the list. Uh, this one, GDPR data erasure. Uh, login with creased erased user account. So uh, a few things in here. It looks like it's a broken authentication problem. However, uh, if you look at this, you know, it, the, the hint is that it's an erased user account and what can we do for finding 
you know, potential accounts that have been erased or potentially getting information from a user database. And by the way, I actually just mentioned something very, you know, very relevant there, a database. Well, let's log out as user one and then try to log in again. And we saw a few examples of, you know, SQL injection. What if we actually do um, escape, right? And I'm doing the delimiter here for literal and a single quote or deleted at, which is a function in or a SQL statement, right? To look at the, the you know, any deleted records. But then we go and say, you know, is not null not null and then dash dash right so in this case actually we are doing another boolean uh, um, expression here we're looking at the deleted at attribute and then we're specifying that that's actually not null and I'm, I'm going to try to actually I have to probably put a password here right but I'm going to try to actually see if we can gather information from the database or if we're able to potentially you know log in as a user so if I click on that and there you go you will see that you successfully solve a challenge GDPR data erasure with Chris Erases login account. In this case, of course, it was a deleted account from the system that, you know, uh, the, the name was actually Chris. If we go to our account, yep, you see Chris Pike at jush-sh.op. So let's actually remember that juice shop URI, right? So juice-sh. Dot op. That may be actually good for another exercise. So let me log out of, out of that user. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> maybe that actually we just did another challenge in here without even knowing, right? Provoke an error that is neither very graceful or consistently handled. It's because, of course, that account, quote unquote, was actually deleted and probably was not able to actually, you know, you know, behave correctly. And we logged out and actually solved the issue, the, the challenge without even knowing. All right. So if I go back to the scoreboard, we should look at that Chris account being solved. And then there's another one here, Amy and Bender and Jim. Uh, Jim actually has a tutorial, so I'm not going to do that one. Cause, uh, that one, you know, you can do in your own. But let's look at Amy. So login Amy. So it says login with Amy's original user credentials. This could take... 93.83 billion trillion trillion centuries to brute force but luckily she did not read the one important final note uh, one important final note let's actually you know search what that is right let's search on the main items of google and as you know and of course i don't have the port swigger ca certificate i should do that uh, but let me just take out the preferences and then in this case, I'm going to do no proxy for, and in, let's go back to the Googles. And there you go. You see actually um, password haystacks. So let's go over this website. And, uh, you know, please don't click on everything that you see in Google. But in this case, you know, we already knew that this actually is the, the challenge, right? So. What you want to do in a real world is that you're actually trying to gather as much as information as possible. So as I show you before, you know, even after, after I log in with Chris, the first thing that I notice is what is actually the user convention, right? Or the email convention. Uh, before we were able to log in as admin, uh, but I never actually highlighted, you know, that, that the URI was actually, you know, the one that we highlighted before, right? But in here, we're actually trying to get, gather as much information as possible. This is actually part of the reconnaissance phase on any pen test, right? So it looks like this is actually a brute force or interactive brute force search uh, calculator. So one of the things that we saw before is that the hint told us that there was 93.83 billion trillion centuries, right? And it took us also, uh, and of course, you know, that there was an important final note and the final note in this case is actually this right here. And uh, this is, oh, there you go. Important final note. It says the example with Doug, which is the password that we see here, is that it should not be taken literally because everybody began padding their passwords with simple dots. So attacker, of course, can add those dots in their guesses to bypass the need to fully search uh, you know, through, through padding. 
Now, in the real world, you know, what you want to do is try to get as much information about a specific user using open source intelligence or OSINT and um, using, you know, public records and so on. In this case, of course, this is fictitious. If this was a real example, you know, I'll probably go to LinkedIn and go to many other sources, you know, social media out there to see what else can be related to this user. So I, instead of me taking, you know, this billion, trillion, trillion centuries to brute force, I can potentially do attacks that are fairly similar to this, like, you know, in this case, similar padding trick. And um, now let's assume that, and of course I already know this, but let's assume that you have a, a knowledge of the user's husband, right? And the num the name of the husband is Kif, written as K1F. So instead of the dog example that we have here, right? We can actually copy and paste all that, all those um, dots, so we don't have to, you know, we don't have to worry about it. And then we go back and then go to login. And then it was Amy at juice dash s h o p, and remember that we, you know we explore that email address, and then in here, let's try to do the k. Let me actually do this so you can see it uh, by unhiding the password. So uh, k one f for kif, and then we'll paste all the dots that we had in there for Doug. And let's see what that actually does. And as you see here, we were able to solve the challenge. Of course, I'm giving you the answers and I'm walking you through this CTF, right? So this uh, juice shop, in, uh, as I mentioned to you in the real world, what you want to do is research, you know, what are the possibilities for you to be able to leverage, you know, common user behavior plus uh, very insecure applications in some cases allowing you to you know to provide weak credentials like this and to be able to um, you know take advantage of you know similar attacks right and then you combine that with either social engineering or OSINT so uh, whenever I mention OSINT let me actually do an annotation here and then sh do in, in drawing mode and OSINT uh, let me change the color too huh. but OSINT as I mentioned so O-S-I-N-T, that stands for Open Source Intelligence. And basically it's you looking for public records, things in social media, things like DNS records. But in this case, we actually want to manipulate what a potential user should put in their passwords, right? So if I go to somebody's, you know, I search for the name of that person or the email address and look for LinkedIn, I may be able to actually get more references or go to something like Facebook may be able to get, you know, her uh, husband's name uh, as, as well, right? So in this case, you know, it was kind of predictive and uh, prescribed by me. And that's why you were able to actually solve the, the challenge. We, I solved the challenge, you know, fairly quickly. In the real world, this actually takes a little bit longer time for you to figure out, right? And you can actually search for other references based on the hints that you're getting in the juice shop application. Let's go over one more exercise. And in this case, uh, let's take a look at the first one, you know, admin registration. So it says register with a user with administrator privileges. Hmm. So that's a tricky one, right? So we want to register with a user that actually has administrative privileges. Uh, well, we probably have to look at how the registration process works, right? So now we're logged in as Amy. I'm going to log back out and I'm going to try to register an account, right? So remember that if you go to login and there's a, a section here to register, not a yet customer. So if you click on that, you're going to see the registration f a, a page. So what I want to do is actually configure my browser again to use the proxy so I go to manual proxy configuration in there. I'm going to uh, click at a few or close a few windows in here. And then let's actually, you know, try to log in as a specific. And then let's try to register with a specific um, a account. Uh, let's see. Um, let's go and do admin. As a matter of fact, I already had admin at admin.com in here. 
and then we can actually put some type of password. I'm gonna put you know one two three one two three. I'm gonna repeat the password, and then I'm gonna select any question in here. Uh, let's say mother's maiden name, and I'll put some something right. Then once I click on register, oh I forgot to put my my browser or my burp suite to intercept on. So let me go back to the registration page. And then I'm going to go to burp, turn on intercept. And then in here, I'm going to put admin at admin.com. Then 123123. Of course, you can put anything that you want in here. And then for the security question, mother's maiden name, let's put again something. Once we go and submit that, you see that burp actually now intercepted the transaction. And you see the email that we put, admin at admin, password, password repeat, security question, and in this case, an ID for the security question, mother's maiden name, and then some timestamp in here, updated, uh, security answer was something. But it says that we need to log in with or, or register with a user that the role would be admin. So this is actually JSON, right? Uh, what is it you're sending and it's actually going through an API and it says, you know, the API method, um, URI says, you know, users. Uh, so a role may be an attribute, right? So we can actually edit this in here and put something like role and then uh, probably, you know, another string of I guess admin and then comma and then let's see what happens if I you know forward that to the application and of course you have a few other transactions that you have to forward to and then you go back in I, we haven't populated it yet so I'm gonna go and continue to forward that to the application and there you go I see some green lights in the in the back or at least a green banner so we actually were able to register a user by manipulating the input of the registration pro uh, uh, process and then we register a user with administrative privileges right as an administrator so that means that now we should be able to and let me turn off intercept we should be able to log in in here with admin at admin.com and then the one two three one two three password let me make sure that i'm typing it correctly there you go and then you see that now we're logged in we're logged in as an admin privilege and if you were as an admin user with those privileges and let's look at you know deluxe membership and yeah we looks like we are logged in as an administrator so we solved that other challenge as well in the previous exercises i walk you through you know many different attacks and different challenges and basically we did them pretty much manually right uh, we were using things like our web browser right we were interacting with the application trying to see the developer uh, tools and inspecting different elements looking at the storage and the you know session storage and you know things that we can actually gather additional information from the application itself right things like the network and all the different files uh, and so on right now um there are different other tools that in the real world you can actually use for you know a real pen test that will help you accelerate and automate a lot of the reconnaissance a lot of the attacks and so on i did not want for you know i didn't want for you to be exposed to those tools from the beginning because i wanted for you to actually understand the underlying issues and the underlying problems right looking into you know logs of the applications or interacting with proxies and be able to not only intercept but also modify the transactions of the web application. However, there are many different tools that you can actually use in the in a real pen test because of course you want to automate as much as possible because you're running against time, right? And uh, time is of essence and time is money as people say out there. But what, to conclude today, what I want to show you is an amazing tool that is a, a, an official project, a mature project with OWASP, right? The same entity that created the juice shop and many other things in the industry. And that tool is called the OWASP Z Attack Proxy. So if you go to, um, you know, in, in the case of Kali, 
you can go to Web Application Analysis and you see OWASP ZAP. ZAP stands for Z Attack Proxy. So if you click on that, you will launch the OWASP Z Attack Proxy. And of course, you know, this will take a few seconds. And then what I'm going to do is I'm, I don't want to persist this session. This is only for demonstration purposes only. And then here you actually see um, a tool that, you know, it doesn't look similar, but it has similar functionality as Burp Suite. Of course, as I mentioned, Burp Suite has two different versions, the Community Edition and also the Pro version of Burp. And one of the differences between the Community Edition and the Pro is that in the Pro version, you can do automatic scans and you can do a lot of automated, you know, uh, enumeration of application directories and, you know, potential, you know, flaws and vulnerabilities based on, uh, you know, not only cross site script and cross site request forgery tags and, and so on, but a lot of other input validation vulnerabilities or looking at the actual underlying technology vulnerabilities. So known vulnerabilities or CVEs against, let's say, Apache or Apache struts, OpenSSL, and many other things that you will find in modern applications. Now, in this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you can perform an automated scan and then enumerate a lot of the different attacks or different elements within that application, the Juice Shop application. Now, you can click on automated scan, and in here you can type the IP address or the URI. In this case, it's going to be via IP address. 10.6.6.104, and then I'm going to go over port 8882, which is the port that Juishop is actually running. And you have several options as well. You can actually do standard mode, safe mode, protected mode, or attack mode. Attack mode is a lot more comprehensive and you know a lot more aggressive scan. Uh, also, another thing that I want to highlight in, in the real world, if you're actually doing this, uh, you probably don't want to get caught, right? So if you launch attack mode, it may be extremely verbose and you may be able to actually be detected. Even with standard mode, it may be that a security operations center may get alarms from IPS devices or any other security devices that they may have in the network that may detect you, you know, trying to enumerate users, enumerate directories and so on, right? But in this case, I'm actually just going to do the standard mode for this example. And then from there, I'm going to click on attack and leave everything as default. And you see that I'm going over many different um, places that is already, you know, following within the the actual, you know, application. So you see that, you know, it was able to find FTP and coupons and, you know, Easter eggs. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's most definitely already solving a lot of challenges for us automatically, right? So, and as a matter of fact, you can see there, you know, we solve a confidential document um, a challenge just by running this. And of course, this is a script kitty way. And whenever I say script kitty, right, I want it for you to actually go and yes, don't use these tools, but try to solve the challenges by hand. And then after that, you know, use this type of tools to actually, you know, become familiar with them and seeing how you can accelerate and automate all the different enumeration and the finding of vulnerabilities. As a matter of fact, if you actually go to a Spider, you see all the different GET requests that are being uh, done. And you see, you know, the, the scan is only 28% right now, but it was actually able to find tons of different things. Uh, flaws around potential cross-site scripting protection uh, not being enabled and information disclosure, you know, information in comments, right? Um, uh, also, cross-domain configuration, misconfigurations rather, uh, JavaScript source file inclusion, I mean, tons and tons and tons of them in an automated fashion, right? But again, uh, the homework for you, for you today is to continue to explore the juice shop and to continue to actually apply all the different methodology or the different techniques and methodologies that I'm showing you throughout these videos. And again, you know, as I mentioned to you, just the Websploit VM has over 400 different exercises and just uh, the OS Juice Shop has, you know, tons and tons of them as you saw. So please complete, you know, these in your own time. In, in the following weeks, we're actually going to look at other intentionally vulnerable applications and many other examples on how you can find web-based uh, vulnerabilities like cross-site request forgery, 
command injection, and so on. So stay tuned, and I see you in the next video.